but t today we want to get into the second dimension of the, 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 the relationship that God is drawing us into, uh, where now he will make affirmation that you will be my people because I am the Lord your God. So that's where we want to go this morning. It's a journey to the Mount of Sinai. Uh, Mount Sinai. <coughs> So, shall we uh, pray as we begin? Lord, we just sense the presence of you in this place. And we long, Lord, to be respons responsive to you in every way and in every measure for what you, for what you want to bring forth in us in these days, in this community. Lord, as we ponder the journey that you led your people on uh, to Mount Sinai this morning, we pray, Father, that your spirit will open our minds, open our hearts, and uh, take hold of us, Lord. Draw us into the lessons that you are longing to teach your people as they, they begin a whole new life together as a community. Lord, lead us by your spirit this morning. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so we come now to uh, this second great dimension of the Exodus. And it's the, uh, it's the journey to Mount Sinai and the meeting at Mount Sinai. And all that God was doing now to form a people because he was the Lord their God. And uh, the third dimension that we will get into next week is that he will dwell in our midst. I almost was hoping at the end of our fast we'd gotten to this point, but we're not. I'm going to stay true to the story, and it's still forming a people. Maybe that's where the Lord is really wanting to, to, to draw our attention anyway. So... That's where we go. This is the next huge chapter in the story. Uh, so, it all begins now when uh, God uh, miraculously, through those ten, ten power encounters with the gods and the echelon of power in Egypt, and he draws them out. And now, where do they go? The shortest and the most simple route is to go this way to the promised land. But it says, and we begin now in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, and listen carefully now to these words. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was the shorter route. This was the obvious way to go. It was the shortest. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. Ponder that. If they face war, they might change their minds and go back. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. He led them back this way. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. There's kind of a, an enigma in that, in, in, in that paragraph because I think Israel went up armed for battle, but in many ways they were not ready for the warfare. So God was leading them in this other way, and there's going to be now a tremendous lessons that God is going to teach them he puts them, he leads them down here uh, to, the, to the Red Sea, and they become hemmed in by the Egyptian army, and there's no way forward except the Red Sea. They're in a humanly impossible situation. There's no way forward, humanly speaking. Now, this is going to draw us into this amazing uh, 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 
act of God at the Red Sea, by which he, and some people, you know, I think the New Testament will say, you were baptized through this. It's a, it's a cutting off and a deliverance that brings forth a whole new people in a whole new way. And then as they're being led into the wilderness now, in a way that leads to Mount Sinai, he's beginning to form a people for himself. You will be my people. And these are the lessons now that God is going to begin to teach the people. And that's what we want to get into this morning. This first great act of deliverance then leads to these five lessons. And then there is the affirmation of who they will be in terms of his people. There's great significance in these lessons. We can ponder them carefully because they have great instruction for the people that God is Lord of and how they need to be his people in relationship to their Lord. So that first great dimension of the Exodus is God proves his name. I am the Lord. Lord means redeemer. One who reaches down and takes hold of and draws to himself. I am the Lord, your God. And it follows then, you will be my people. But this journey now begins to form a people in a very, very special way. Great lessons, five lessons, that uh, it seems God leads people into, uh, the, the story leads us into here. So let's begin with this uh, miraculous e event at the crossing of the Red Sea. Mo uh, Moses uh, tells the Israelites to turn back and to camp at this place alongside the Red Sea. And then God says, I'm going to gain glory for myself. I'm going to reveal my name in a whole new way to you in this situation. Moses uh, <clears throat> said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance of the Lord. You will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to stand still. Stand, and he will fight for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? There's a time when prayer uh, needs to come to an end. And God now says, stretch out your hand. Here's an exercise of authority that is birthed in relationship to the Lord. Raise your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after you, and then I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army. And that's amazingly what happens. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night, the Lord separated those waters, and the Israelites went through. As the, as the Egyptians ran after them, they're thrown into confusion. The wheels of the chariots came off so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And a great separation begins to take place. The Lord is with these people. He's made way for them. And uh, he is cutting them off and separating them from that idolatrous environment that they were in. When you think about Egypt and what is needed now with the people who lived in the context of an idolatrous environment like Egypt, there's a great deal of new formation in terms of who you are that probably needs to take place. Because idolatry deceives. It enslaves, it oppresses, 
It trusts in human power and control. It's fueled by greed. And it corrupts rulership. And you see that. That's, that's what these people were immersed in, in the context of Egypt. You'll see this continuing to, to, to be the, the, the big theme of what happens to the people of God. When they don't worship God, you will eventually worship other gods. Because you've been made to worship. And you see it happening in Judges. What happens in the midst of idolatry is that the word of the Lord becomes very, very rare. It becomes very, very rare. It's hardly heard again. So this is the environment now that the people are coming out of. When the Lord uh, stretched, uh, uh, when, when, the, when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the waters began to separate, and the Egyptians went through. And then, as the Egyptians uh, ran after them, as you know, the sea comes back. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Egyptians saw the great power the Lord displayed against them, the people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. And then it breaks out into song. We could spend the whole lesson on this song. It's an amazing song. And it was probably sung in succeeding generations, the psalm that you find there in Exodus chapter 15. One little thing I notice about that song that I really think is very, very significant, beginning with verse 13, In your unfailing Lord you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until the people pass by. You will bring them in and you will plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling. That sanctuary your hands established a dwelling place. That is a fresh new theme, I think, that God is doing among us. He's coming and dwelling in fresh new ways among us. So it was a great song. And then as they come out on the other side of the sea, we enter in now to these five great lessons. And it seems like the book of Exodus is wanting to draw the people that are newly being formed as the Lord's people into these lessons because they teach us how we are to be in terms of his people, trusting him. So it says, beginning with verse 22 now in Exodus, and uh, I've got uh, five now pictures, I think, of these five lessons that, that he draws uh, the people into. Uh, Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Now, if you can just imagine the number of people that are coming out of Egypt and all that needs to happen to train them to be and to do what God is wanting to do with these people, uh, you, you, you can really imagine all the confusion and the, uh, oh, it would really be something when people come out of such a deeply rooted, idolatrous, enslaving environment. Okay? But here are those lessons that really begin to form a people. 
So three days without water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink it, its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. So we got this theme here of, of, of bitter that becomes sweet. And it just, it, it's like the Lord showed him something. He obeyed that, and things changed. I think that's something of the lesson that is here. There the Lord made a decree. Now, it's almost as if this verse begins to, 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 to describe for us what God is doing in the midst of these tests. Okay? This first one. Uh, the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, if you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. I will heal you. And I, and I can only imagine that word feels, that, 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 that word has probably a lot more dimension than what we typically think. It's not just physical healing, it's healing in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, so if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his commands, keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the, any of the diseases I brought up on the uh, Egyptians. There is a lesson. There's a lesson. Of follow my commands. The next one. Chapter 16, the whole Israelite community then set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day now of the second month, two months, 15 days, now this lesson begins to emerge. This is, you know, where true, real training takes place is when you are engaged in mission and you learn as you do. And God brings out lessons in the context of situations where he can embed things in your hearts in deep and significant ways. Rather than drawing people out completely out of context and uh, try to teach a lesson devoid of context, we don't learn as well. Okay. So here they are, two months, 15 days. It says, in the desert, the whole community began to grumble against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You could ponder those words and see what happens in our own hearts when we do not trust and we do not obey. We begin to what? We grumble against. We only if we had. You'll you, you'll you'll tend to want to turn back. Those those back days seem to be more glorious. <laughs> That's not really usually the case. Was that the case with Israel? No, that was not. But they seemingly this is what happens to us. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day, gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions or not. And on the sixth day, you are to gather twice as much and rest on the seventh. Here's a huge lesson that God is going to teach the people. It's going to be in the very fabric of the the, 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 the structure of our life and calendar, rhythm of life. And this is the lesson that God is going to teach them. 
You can imagine a people who've lived in a, such an idolatrous environment and the type of formation that needs to take place in them. And if we were in this situation, what would we be prone to do? If you have no food. It's very interesting how God says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach you when you don't have, and this is how you will have on a daily basis, not gathering up, and embedded on the sixth day is going to be twice as much so that you rest on the seventh day. There's something very, very significant in all of this lesson that God is teaching here. Yeah. I'm going to rain down bread from heaven for you. These are the instructions. Go out each day and gather an omer, enough per person. Not more, not less, just enough per person, daily basis. On the sixth day, gather twice as much and rest on the Sabbath. Keep nothing till morning. That's interesting. In the, in the, uh, in the story, you keep finding that there's always some people that never follow the instructions. <laughs> and they gather more. What happens? It's very interesting. What happens? So you got this great lesson that in, in the context of the pilgrimage and journey of Israel, how God is beginning to form a people, you will be my people. And this is how I will form you in terms of provision daily. Lord, what's the Lord's Prayer? Give us what? This week? This month, this year, five-year plans? No, not, not to mock those. <laughs> but no, it's daily. It's daily. Daily. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a huge lesson. Right in the fabric of the Lord's Prayer for his people. And here is where it is being formed. And here's where it's being nurtured in the people if they follow his instructions. No one's to keep any of it till morning. Some of them didn't obey the instructions, and what happens? Maggots. It's interesting. And then on the seventh day, they rested. And this was going to begin to form a rhythm of a week and a Sabbath rest in the people of God and daily provision and rest. Daily provision, rest. <clears throat> Obey, and then you will know. Now, our Western education says what? Know and then obey? It's different. And then there, come, there comes a testimony and a remembrance that we pass on to future generations because of how we were led by the Lord when we trusted and obeyed him. You will leave a legacy for future generations. And this is what God wants to do. <clears throat> it says, the Lord then com commanded them as, as they began to learn daily provision uh, this is what the Lord commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. I made provision for you on a daily bread. On a daily bread. Put. Now this word put, this is the same word that, that God used when he put Adam and Eve in the garden to be a testimony to who, himself. It's a, it, the, this word put is a very important word in terms of you will, you will create a testimony for future generations. And take this omer now, put it in a jar right beside the Ark of the Covenant, and it will be a witness to future generations. So there is lesson number two. 
What does this make you think of? It's a, it's a huge lesson we all will face in terms of daily provision and how God wants to train us in it in relationship to him and his command to form a people who give testimony to future generations. It's a huge lesson. So, training lesson number two. Training lesson number three. It says, a whole Israelite community then set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Now they've run out of water. Bread and now water. It's very significant what God instructs them to do. It says they quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink. Usually you'll find this. You find complaint that goes to leadership when there's no longer trust in the camp. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? You just ponder those words and and you you get a sense of the warped mind that that we acquire when we lose trust. We begin to reflect an image of God that is not true about him. Why did the Lord bring us out here to kill us in the desert? Do you really? Is that really what the Lord is doing? But the people were thirsty for water. They grumbled against Moses and so forth. So Moses cries out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, walk on ahead of the people and take, the, uh, take some elders of Israel with you and the staff of God in your hand. Now there's the image. Go on ahead of the people. Some of the elders go with you. Take the staff of God in your hand with which you struck the Nile and I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. So here is an image of a rock at Horeb. And Moses is instructed to strike the water, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Instruction. Strike the rock, and water will come out for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah, and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So he does this in the sight of all Israel. And God made provision. It's interesting, it's a rock. You notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, As you look back on this whole pilgrimage now in this particular event, this is what uh, Paul records for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They ate, they all ate the same spiritual food when they came out of Egypt. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Notice, the spiritual rock that accompanied them. Who is that? And that rock was Christ. They drank from him. They fed on him. Oh, I keep thinking of that Emmaus Road walk. And what did Jesus say to those two disciples as he led them through the whole story from Moses and through all the prophets? Somehow I think this might have been one part of it. You know? And it's a revelation of his presence that was with them. And when they drink and when they feed, uh, there is provision day after day after day after day. And the elders here are to, to, to witness this. 
and, it, and you get the picture then of all of this in the, in, the, in, the, in the midst of the complaint of the people. And it's, just ponder the words. The people are, are grumbling, and what are they saying? Is the Lord among us or not? And God is actually revealing, I'm very much among you. When you trust me, okay? when you trust me. Then we get to test number four. It says in chapter 18 now, no, the end of chapter 17, it says the Amalekites came and they began to attack the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of the men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will go up on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So here we have this great image now in the midst of enemies that come against the people. Here's what God instructs the people to do. Send Joshua down to, to, to encounter the Amalekites. And Moses goes up on the hill with Aaron and Hur and takes the staff of God and lifts it towards heaven. That's an amazing picture, isn't it? So Joshua fought the Amalekites. And as, as Moses had ordered, as long as Moses held up his hands towards heaven, there was victory on the ground. Isn't that a great image? Our warfare is not this. And it's not just this. It's both. It says, as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone. <laughs> Amazing, what an image. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites. Isn't that amazing? This brought about this victory. You guys know something of this. It's an amazing image. I think God gave it to us in a very special way three years ago at our retreat. I'm not so sure we all entered into it. I'm speaking now to my own staff. But increasingly, I think we are now in a very special way. As he held his staff towards heaven, there was victory on the ground. Then it says, the Lord said to Moses, you've got to remember this. This is a lesson for future generations. Write this down. Write this down on a scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure, I love this little statement, make sure that Joshua hears about it, who is down here. And Joshua is succeeding Moses. Make sure he hears about this lesson. Pass it on to another generation. Because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalekite from under heaven. And then it says Moses built an altar and he called it the Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. A way you really translate this in the Hebrew is, a hand is on the throne of heaven. A hand is on the throne of heaven and there's victory on earth as it is in heaven. What an amazing image. The Lord will war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. It's almost like this lesson will be the lesson of God's people from generation to generation. And I believe you guys are entering into this in an amazing way. 
and it's bringing victory on the ground because thrones are ta taking hold of heaven. This is far beyond the means of men, our warfare. It's far beyond the power of men, the power that overcomes. Heaven on earth, as it is in heaven. <laughs> Amazing picture. Amazing picture. Tremendous lesson. So Moses built an altar there, and he called it, The Lord is my banner. A hand is on the throne. What an amazing testimony for future generations. It comes all the way down to us. That's lesson number four. And then we come to <clears throat> uh, chapter 18, and this is lesson number five. It's another test. And it's now Moses comes, and he meets Jethro, uh, the priest of Midian, his father-in-law. And you can imagine now the testimony that is in Moses to pass on <laughs> When he began at the foot of this mountain, now he's arrived back. Just imagine. And all of this has happened, and here are the people of Israel. This great mob of people that has come out into the desert and meets with God at Mount Sinai. That was the first thing that God said to Moses when he called him. Uh, and Moses just wondered, how will I know that, Lord, you can do this through me in delivering this people? And he said, I will give you a sign. You will worship me at this mountain with those people. And here he comes. Here it comes. He's now at this uh, place uh, with this great uh, horde of <laughs> untrained uh, uh, people that have been brought out of idolatry, uh, but they're being formed as the people of God. And uh, you find the great discussion between Moses now and Jethro. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that, is, that is said there in verse 11, now I know that the, Jethro says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods. This great deliverance proves the name of the Lord of these people. And it is like no other god in Egypt. And the next day, then, it says that uh, uh, Jethro, as he began to observe what was happening between Moses and all these people, here comes a lesson, and it's, it, and it's the final kind of lesson uh, in the formation of these people that seems to, to, to be uh, taught here to us. Moses' father-in-law, when he saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Why is it? Okay. Moses answered, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. It's not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God. Notice, here's the instructions. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them, then, the decrees and laws. Instruct them, how, instruct them how to live. Then, select capable men, men who fear God, who are trustworthy, hate dishonest gain, appoint them so that you can handle the load. This is a great lesson. This is a great lesson. It doesn't abnegate Moses of his responsibility or his role. It draws others into, in, in, 
the instruction upon which we all live and helps carry the load with multiplication of people. Some over thousands, some over hundreds, some over fifties, some over tens. And it's the law of the Lord that will get administrated to form a people in this way. Okay? So that you can handle the load. So that you can handle the load. That's an amazing lesson. So Moses chose capable men from all Israel, made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they served as judges, administering, administering the lordship of the Lord, the righteousness of the Lord, the character of the Lord, the ways of the Lord among the people. Now, there's a great lesson in this for God's people in terms of administration okay, and how to govern, how to carry the load. But notice who you should choose. Choose what? Men who fear God over all else. Men who are trustworthy. They walk in truth, no matter what it costs. They hate dishonest gain. You know what it's like to be under a leader who's, who's seeking to gain something for himself? It corrupts righteous rulership. Corrupts righteous rulership. Hate dishonest gain. And appoint them then. People need to be appointed. People need to be entrusted and uh, you see the, 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 the load that will be carried now in the midst of Israel. And so the priest of Midian, Jethro, his father-in-law, gives him these instructions. And uh, it's a great final lesson that's given to Moses. Okay, and then we come now to the, to the, to the pinnacle of what all these lessons are leading to. It's forming a people, and as they now find themselves at Mount Sinai, God comes down and he begins to meet with them. And these are the words that he says. And I think these are the foundational words that will be embedded in the identity of the people, the community of Israel that encapsulates what is meant by you will be my people. You find this now in Exodus chapter 19, 1 through 6. And again, just to listen to these words. When Moses went up to God on the Mount Sinai, and God called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Israel, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. You have known how I, and then he uses this image of an eagle who often nests on the side of a mountain in order to train its young. An eagle will push the young out of the nest and as the young flutters down because it hasn't learned to fly, the mother eagle swoops down and f comes up under that fluttering baby and brings him back to the nest. The little baby grabs hold of the back of the mother eagle and he's brought back to the nest. <coughs> then the mother pushes him out again. Swoops down, catches him, draws him back to the nest. God uses that image, it's very interesting, at a mountain of what he has done in coming down as Lord and taking them out and brings them to himself. I carried you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. Now, because I am your mother eagle, no, I am what? The Lord, your God. You will be my people. And he says these words. 
if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my, and we've got now three things here, you will be my what? Treasured possession. This is a very special word in Hebrew. There's two different words for treasure. One is portable treasure, like jewelry. Another word for treasure is a, a, a fixed asset, like a building or a piece of uh, a land or something. Which one do you suppose it is? It's the portable treasure. You will be my portable treasure. You will be my jewelry that I will display among the nations. I am taking you among the nations. You will reflect me see, because you are my possession. We've got to remember that word. God comes and he actually dwells among us. See, this is what's going to be next week. Uh, we're going to see what, what that lesson is all about. But we are a treasured possession who belongs to the Lord. We're portable. God can take us and display us among the nations. Okay? You will be for me, not for yourself or not for anybody else. You will be for me a what? A kingdom of priests. Now, this, this phrase is significant in that it has to do with rulership and priesthood. And they're together. You cannot separate them. You're going to be a people who is king priests. Kingdom, you are one who submits to the lordship of, of the Lord, and inherently you administer that on earth, and you administer it as a priest before me. This is kind of, I think, what it, what it means here. You're going to be a king priest community okay, uh, for the nations. You will administer rulership. You will administer priesthood among the nations. You will draw them to me. You will walk in my ways and reflect my lordship. Because I am your God. Your image. No other image like him. And we've been made in that image. And we reflect it in this way. Uh, you will be for me a holy nation. For me, holy, meaning completely other, set apart, like me. Because I am holy, you will be holy. Okay. So here is a reflection of God's firstborn son. And then he gives them five commands, vertical commands, five horizontal commands. And this is who you are in terms of the image of God as you worship him. You become like him. You become like what you worship, right? Psalm 115, you become like what you worship. You worship false idols, eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, mouths that cannot speak, arms that cannot grasp, feet that cannot walk. You become like what you worship. You will become blind, deaf, dumb, lame. You worship the Lord who sees, who hears, who speaks, who walks. You become like him. You become like who you are. And that affirms who you are in terms of your true self. And then you walk that out in relationship to your neighbor. As you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you walk it out in relationship to others. This is restoration of kingdom community that is priestly on the face of the earth. Ah, yes, you guys know about this. And we walk in those ways. So, there, there's the five vertical commands. No other gods before me. No other gods before me. Make no idol in the form of anything. You can just imagine what this meant for the people that were brought out of an idolatrous situation. Idol idolatry, oh, and I can just see this so deeply in India, it just corrupts you to the core because it makes you deaf, dumb, blind, because you've got false image. 
that is not like you. And when you worship something that is not like you, you, you become like what you worship. Dead. Do not misuse the name. The name above all names. Because you belong. You carry the name. You walk in the name. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Time. Honor your father and mother. These are vertical commands that have great implications in terms of the image of God in us. We violate these commands. We violate who we are and who we've been made to be and who God is. And then, as we walk in these, we walk in this in relationship to our neighbor. Not murder, not commit adultery, not steal, not give false testimony, not covet. We're reflecting the image of God in those commands. We violate these commands and we violate who we are and who we've been made to be. And we do not give testimony to the God we serve. Okay. Hugely significant. Well, God has brought the people out to himself. And now at that mountain, you're going to see next week what happens as Moses is giving these instructions up on the mountain and what begins to happen down in the camp to a people who yet not been formed out of an idolatrous Egypt. And you will see what emerges in the camp. And it's a great story next week. Oh, it's one of my most favorite stories of what happens when Moses comes off the mountain and he finds what's happening in the, ta in the camp and what God leads him to do in the midst of that. It is a great lesson for us. So I am what? The Lord your God. Therefore, you will be my people. And next week... I'm going to come and dwell in your midst. I'm going to come and dwell in your midst. He's come, and he's coming in increasing measure. And we're being formed as a people to carry his name among the nations. Amen? Okay, we'll stop with that. Any response now that people would like to make in terms of God puts many things on people's hearts that we need to hear. Uh, I Michael. Uh, one of the biggest things that he said was uh, two, well, two things actually was, one, in their enslavement, they actually thought that they were fat and fed, but, so they were disillusioned in the wilderness to think they had it better than they did. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. Often we look back and we think that was better than now. It's often a delusion. Yeah. Yes. And the, the second thing, which is something that's really confirming what God has been telling me, is to record your victories. Ah, record your victories. Record your victories. Yeah, how many of you keep track of a journal? Oh, good. You know, I think it's a really a significant thing. If you go up to my office, You've got a, a, a sequence of journals from 1974 to the present. But it's amazing. I look back at where I was in 1974. <laughs> but it's amazing to just reflect on the lessons that God teaches you. It is very, very valuable for you to do this. To write it down. Write it down. And sometimes you need to actually symbolize the lesson. This ring is a symbol. I've got one other ring. It has to do with what God's going to do on this campus. This ring. So, memorialize it. Yes, yes. Reflecting on the idea of the kingdom of priests, and um, you know, it's a pretty unique thing that God did with 
a kingdom of priests. And normally that was a very uh, um, I'll say, uh, unique position among a few people uh, within a nation. But now he calls the entire nation the kingdom. And from a, a missionary standpoint, you know, thinking, well, why wouldn't it be better to plant a few priests within each kingdom of the world? But I think there's a there's a very unique dynamic of community uh, in that priesthood that Israel was to wow. be a part of. So, you know, and, and it was Israel in that day. Today, it's it's organizations like this or local churches that there's a dynamic. So none of us are to serve that priesthood um, alone. It's just yes. in that community. Yeah. Sometimes I actually think in community, when there is the Lord among us and his presence is with us, we reflect the image of God in ways that you never can reflect as an individual. We've got female, we've got male, and we've got all the giftings and the unique creation that each one of us is in, in that image. And when you put those together in community, in alignment, you see a reflection of an image of God in increasing measure. And we're, this is something of the testimony of what God is doing on this campus. He's bringing together a people of various tribes to reflect the image and the purpose of God on the face of the earth. Yeah. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. And uh, provision will follow when we obey. We don't follow provision. Provision follows. Oh, but you go out on a limb when you do that. <laughs> but it's a limb of faith and obedience. The provision follows. Faith and obedience in the kingdom does not follow provision. Uh, Nicole. Yeah, as you were, you know, as I was just soaking up what you were saying, I often wonder, um, you know, I kind of feel sorry for the Israelites life because in some ways I wonder if I might have started to grumble too if I didn't have water. <laughs> yeah. so I'm going to release you, huh? All right? Blessing. Let me just close this in prayer, shall we? Father, we just dwell in your presence in this place, in this community, in these days. Lord, we glory in all that you are and all that you do and how you do it. Lord, we treasure the words that you've given us in your book. We treasure, Lord, the, the love in the community that you form. And uh, we just long, Lord, to follow you in these days. We pray that you will create a testimony in this community in these days that will go to the nations. Because we've walked with you, we've believed you, we've followed your instructions and allowed and opened the door for you to do what is beyond us, beyond what we're capable of, 
beyond the provision that we have. Lord, may you be a treasured possession in us that we value and we glory in, that it might be displayed among the nations as a king-priest community that is holy God's, reflecting the image. Lord, have your way among us, we pray. And we just glory in, 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 in what you are doing. Thank you, Lord. Guard and keep by the power of your name that which is yours in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.